Huda, a light in every home. Allah is my heart's speech. Your mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen allow me to advance. Help me in my quest. Permit me to pass the ultimate test. Help me in my quest. Permit me to pass the ultimate test. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa al-aqibatu lil-muttaqeen. ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأولين والآخرين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Dear brothers and sisters everywhere السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome back to another live edition of Ask Uda Our phone numbers beginning with the air code 0020238552428 or 249 and the email address is ask at huda.tv and the Facebook page is www.facebook.com forward slash msalah official we've been answering mashallah many questions that we received on the Facebook page and uh, the answer or the episodes which have the answers to these questions are uploaded on a regular basis alhamdulillah to that web page uh, we have a couple of pending questions from yesterday, from Sunday's episode. Uh, the first question was pertaining Salat al Tasabih, the very common question, and whether it is a Sunnah or not. Salat al Tasabih narrated in one hadith, only one single hadith, narrated by Al Abbas, the Prophet's uncle, may Allah be pleased with him. In which he said that the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Ya Abbas, Ya Ammi, Ala Ahbuka, Ala Utiyaka, Ala Utiyaka. And he counted ten verses. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, O oh my uncle Al Abbas, shall I not give you, shall I not grant you, shall I not give you a gift? And he counted ten verses. And he said to do the following to offer four rak'ahs in the first rak'ah. You recite Al-Fatiha, then a surah, then afterward you say this dua or dhikr 15 times. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. You say this whole set 15 times. Then you make ruku' and you say it 15 times a ruku' And you rise up from ruku' and you say it 10 times. Then you make sujood, you recite it 10 times in sujood. You sit up from sujood. Ten times you recite it. You go to sujood again. So the total number of saying the dhikr is 75 times in each rak'ah of the four rak'ahs. Uh, in this hadith, he said that the Prophet ﷺ said, if you can do it once every day, do it. If you can do it uh, once a week, do it. Or once a month or at least once in your lifetime. Uh, because he said, if you do so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive all your sins and he counted many verses. Uh, this hadith is disputed between the scholars of hadith and sunnah as far as its authenticity. Some say it is weak, some say it's fair, some say it is sound. So those who consider the hadith weak and they do not rely on the weak a hadith in establishing an act of worship, particularly prayer or fasting or whatever, they said, no, it is not uh, recommended to do such ibadah because we cannot confirm the authenticity of the hadith. And it's only narrated by one single person. And uh, I deliberately mentioned the setup of the prayer because it's not like any regular prayer. So this is something that's very unique. And at least you should have had a few companions who are aware of that, not only one person, because it's the uniqueness of the setup of the prayer. So that's why they said, no, don't pray it. And many scholars of the past, based on the fact that whether the hadith is sound or even the hadith is weak, but they rely on the weak hadith in establishing virtuous acts, even including the ibadah, they said it is recommended to do it even once per lifetime. So there is a dispute between the scholars pertaining to offering Salat at Tasabih. That 
dispute and conflict should not reflect on our relation to each other or our relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why am I saying that? This is a bad new comment I'm making here. Because some people become judgmental of others. When one asks another, what do you think of Salat al tasabih He says, it's not the sunnah. Then right away he puts an X on him. Oh, this guy is such and such. He categorizes him. And another person, he says that, I'm going to pray Salat al tasabih like in Hajj for innocence. Some people get up to pray Salat al tasabih So others would label them as such and such group or party. It shouldn't be this way. There is a room whether to pray it or not to pray it. Okay, the least it is permissible. But no one should be judgmental of another based on this hadith or this ibadah or similar ibadat, even relying on weak hadith. What do I do personally is, well, I have many alternatives. Yes, I may have done that in the past as I was young, but now I have uh, the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa min al-layli fatahajjada bihi nafilatan laka asa ay yabaathaka rabbuka maqaman mahmooda the night prayer tatajafa junubuhum anil madaji'i yad'oon rabbahum khawfan wa tam'a surat istajda and many other ayat pertaining the verses of the night prayer or at tahajjud resort to that uh, hadith uh, Umm Salama and others pertaining to the nawafil the twelve rak'ahs which if you observe on a regular basis, Allah will build a house for you in paradise, the emphatic sunnah before and after. Do that. The verses of praying duha, the four noon prayer, praying which? So I try to exert the effort in fulfilling the ibadat, which are 100% confirmed that they're virtuous and there is a great deal of reward in doing so. If somebody else does this ibadah based on the fact that he is following an imam or an opinion because many of the scholars of the very righteous scholars uh, relied on this hadith and they considered salat al-tasabih is very vicious okay fine do it there is no problem barakallah fikum assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh brother ahmed from the case eh? wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh how are you sheikh I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you, Ahmad, for asking and welcome to ask with uh, I love you for the sake of Allah. Ahabbak, Allah, the Ahabbak, Tani Fi. Thank you so much. May Allah, the one whom you love me for his sake, love you as well. Amen, amen. Sheikh, I have a question. I just wanted to know the authenticity of this hadith. Yeah. That when you want to ask something for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, if you have any hajjah, that you have to sit in the masjid after Fajr prayer until the shirah, that after the shirah, you have to pay two rakat. And then you just read La ilaha illallah wa ta'ala la sharika la hudmul ku hundred times. And then if you supplicate, then Allah will answer your question. This is authentic hadith. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other Barak questions? Barakallah Barak feekum. Barak 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 Sister Umm Rayyan from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Sheikh, I have a question. Go ahead, please. Um... <coughs> uh, uh, Sheikh, there is uh, some kind of policy here in the kingdom that uh, we cannot work, you know, during our off days or the other times when we are free outside the institution where we work. Mm -hmm. So, okay. uh, is there any way that we can work? Is it halal to work outside when you are on free time, when you are off days or you are on holidays? Okay. If you're talking about working like a freelance or here or there to increase your income, which is already very low, uh, to help yourself or help your family members, as long as that is not affecting your other business, is not warning you out, is not making you fatigued, and you're not working in another official business where this is uh, out low, I don't think there's any problem with that. Giving help to somebody else, uh, somebody else uh, for a compensation during your time off, I believe everybody is free to do so. Okay? As long as it is not uh, outlaw or is something that you may be punished for doing so. Barakallah fiki sister Umm Rayyan. May Allah enrich you out of his bounty. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Abdul Rahman from United Arab Emirates. Wa alaikum salam, Sheikh. Sheikh, how are you today? I'm fine, alhamdulillah, thank you for asking. Barakallah feek. 
I thank you. Sheikh, I have uh, two questions, if you can help me. Yeah. Uh, my first question is, um, if one is going to shower with a near of wudu, can the shower also cover the wudu? This is the first question. Mm -hmm. And then the second question is, um, uh, sujood is sahu. Mm. If uh, can one um, um, maybe you don't know uh, whether to do the sajda before the uh, uh, before the um, taslim before the taslim or after mm. can you do any of them will it be accepted sure okay thank you very much you're most welcome brother Muhammad from Nigeria welcome to the program salamu alaikum assalamu alaikum Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Muhammad. Go ahead, please. Um, I want to ask regarding uh, a dua on the mas'ala uh, after the first study, uh, is it permissible? Dua of al-haja or mas'ala. When? No. When? Uh, after the first salah, after, after completing my first salah. Okay, the, making dua after the fourth prayer. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Brother Ahmed from the KSA, our first caller, pertaining a hadith where he mentioned the setup of a sound hadith pertaining the virtues of praying Fajr in Jama'ah, sitting, making dhikr until it is sunrise, then you pray the two rakahs of duha, at least two rakahs. Up to that, you get the word of performing complete Hajj and Umrah. This is a sound hadith. Afterward, that when you do that, especially so that you can do a certain number of du'as in order uh, of dhikr in order for you to be capable to ask for your need to be fulfilled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I don't have any reference to such thing. Okay? But in fact, the hadith pertaining the verses of Salatul Duha after praying Fajr in Jama'ah and sitting to recite your adhkar until uh, past sunrise, then you pray the duha, you get the word of uh, offering complete hajj and umrah. And the Prophet Sallallahu emphasized the perfect reward of both hajj and umrah for such deed by saying tam matayni, tam matayni, tam matayni. This is valid and confirmed. And as a matter of fact, there was a pending question from yesterday, <coughs> excuse me, where, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Sister Umm Shada from the KSA asked about this particular hadith and said whether this would apply to women if they do the same at home. We all know that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to one of the lady companions, Muhammad, when she said, I love to pray with you in the masjid behind you and listen to your recitation he said i know that but your prayer at home is superior to praying behind me in my masjid this is only for women so i hope i hope that if she does the same she prays fajr and she sits to recite her adhkar until past sunrise then she prays the duha will get the same reward but we do not have a hadith in this regard barakallahu feekum Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Brother Muhammad from Oman. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. It's a pleasure to see you on TV and the amount of knowledge you impart to us is a great thing. And we are very, very grateful to you and for the program and the people who are responsible for it. May Allah accept from all of us. I two things to talk about. In this locality, we find that some people, after the main prayer, once they have finished the prayer, the people who are travelers, then give the adhan and they want to pray the two raka of, of uh, <coughs> uh, combining prayer. While they are praying, we also find that people who have already prayed the main prayer are joining these people for the sunnah prayer. Uh, what is this? Uh, is this permitted or is it uh, not permitted? Okay. And the second thing I want to say, Dr. Uh, sir, is that uh, we find that a lot of Muslims are being persecuted in Burma and Sri Lanka uh, by the Buddhist priests themselves who are leading this, uh, 
demonstrations because the Muslims are doing well and they're jealous and they are also they don't like the dress code of these Muslims. But of course they would like the Muslims from Arab countries to come as tourists. Mm. So I would just like to, to tell you that just make dua for these people, the minority Muslims, both in Sri Lanka and in Burma. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Barakallah Feek, Brother Muhammad, thank you for reminding us. Sister Asia is next, for, next from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, Sister Asia. Uh, Sheikh, I have a question for someone else. Uh, uh, there is somebody who had bought a house in Dubai in 2009 as an investment. Mm. Since then, they have been given zakat for it. But nowadays, the builder says that the project which was to be handed in 2011 will be delayed. Should uh, they, they have asked, should they give zakat this year also? Jazakallah khair. Sister Asya, if you're still on the line, can you hear me? Yes, Sheikh. Okay. Now they bought a flat or a property to live in or to rent it or as an uh, investment as an investment, fully purpose of investment. Okay, okay. So they paid down payment and they have not received the flat yet. Yes, they have given the payment, but uh, they have not received the flat. And okay. the, uh, the, 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 uh, the builder is saying that it will be delayed furthermore. And, and they were given... Uh, and their intention is that they will... Uh, once they receive the flat, they will sell it. Or this is the kind of business they're doing. Yeah, yeah. This is the uh, kind of uh, business they are doing. I mean, I don't know. But this is for what purpose they have purchased this flat. Yeah. Uh, they are always doing this business. I don't know. But this is for the purpose they have done. Because answering this question will help us to determine whether this flat or this kind of investment is the catable or not. There is a big difference between uh, a real estate agent but a relator who is investing, putting money in a flat, he buys it, then he resells it, and so on, or properties. So definitely all the properties are the catapult, whether the money is in cash or in properties. But somebody who's been saving from his income, from his job, and he bought a flat, and he wants to sell it, then he would only pay the cash on it when he sells it, when he collects the cash or when he signs a contract, even if the money is deferred, then he pays the care on that, not before, okay? So answering my question will help me formulate a proper answer because many people, uh, al alhamdulillah, I'm glad that they're doing it anyway, but it doesn't mean that we burden people with what they do not have to do. Barakallah fiqh, sister Asya. If you can get back to me with the exact detail of this kind of investment, inshallah azza jal, will provide you with the proper answer. For instance, if somebody bought a flat and it's sitting there, he doesn't know when will he sell it. There is no zakah on it until he sells it. Okay? What if he decides to rent it? There is no zakah on the flat. It doesn't matter even if it is a million dollar worth, only there will be zakah on the rent when it reaches the zakah level by itself or in addition to other saving or investment. Sister Maria from Mauritius. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, I have two questions. Go ahead. I have two, I have two questions. No. And uh, my first question is that uh, is it allowed to dye our hair? Uh, okay. Uh, the black color and my second question is that even last time I, I asked you about that question because it's just a communication problem you couldn't understand me so I repeat my, my second question once more what is uh, the second question again sister Maria, Maria please only. your second question yeah. please yeah can we give our interest money to someone who is uh, making a construction and uh, making a construction of his house, can we give that person our interest money? 
and that person is not uh, i mean okay he he i, I got your question who, but, uh, yeah i got your question sister mary he needs financial help thank you barakallahu feeki naam Uh, Brother Abdul Rahman from United Arab Emirates. Somebody is taking a shower. Would that be sufficient for wudu? Only when he intends to do wudu, then he washes the organs which should be washed in wudu. فاغسلوا وجوهكم وأيديكم إلى المرافق وامسحوا برؤوسكم وأرجلكم إلى الكعبين. By fulfilling what has been mentioned in this ayah washing the body parts which should be washed during ablution and in order with an intention this is wudu whether you've done wudu in the bathtub or in the basin or somebody's pouring water for you or you were diving in the sea in running water it doesn't matter okay but if somebody took a shower then you stepped out and said i already washed my entire body that should be sufficient for wudu as well, we say no. Because every ibadah requires niyyah. And al wudu is ibadah. Okay, ablution is ibadah. Which will enable you to perform another ibadah, which is as salah, at tawaf, and so on. So you require to precede it with an intention. But mere taking a shower uh, without an intention to perform wudu wouldn't be sufficient. The second question is pertaining uh, the prostrations of forgetfulness or for forgetfulness. His question is, what if somebody is confused, is not educated enough in fiqh, he doesn't know whether should he pray the two sajda after making taslim or before making taslim. It doesn't matter even if you know. The technical details do not affect the validity of the salah nor performing sujood al sah Yeah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam offered it sometimes before the taslim and sometimes after taslim and that's why the Muslim jurists, al-fuqaha, the four schools of thoughts have various opinions as whether should it be prayed before or after and the greatest opinion is it should be prayed before in the positions of forgetfulness where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed it before and after in the situations or situations similar to the situations where the Prophet ﷺ offers sujood or sah after. Laymen are not required to learn all of that. They can just simply either follow the Imam if they're praying in congregation or to pray before or after taslim. It doesn't matter. It would not affect the validity of your prayer. Brother Abdul Rahman from United Arab Emirates. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Um Mushada from the case, eh? Go ahead, sister. Sister Um Mushada, I'm listening. Okay, sir. Uh, we are making a little long sujood. Okay, sir. Uh, when we're making a little long sujood, waking up, I always thought this is my first sujood or second sujood. Mm. Or, uh, or we, uh, when starting up for fourth rekha, uh, I doubt I did one sujood or two sujood in third rekha. So what should do in this situation? No. Or sometimes I remember in the tashafud, last tashafud, uh, doubt uh, I did the same thing. No. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Ahmed from Qatar. Assalamu alaikum, Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you doing today? I'm fine, alhamdulillah, barakallahu feek. Yeah. I have one question that, is it uh, counted as suicide if uh, a person gets killed while performing stunts with his car or his bike or something? While biking? Yeah, exactly. Okay, it depends. If somebody yeah. was biking, normal biking, because these are means of transportation to take us from point A to point B. But if somebody is doing these dangerous moves, amongst the, the, the Gulf, it is known as tafhit, for instance. This is somebody who has killed himself. This is suicide. And he has hurt others 
this is very dangerous, this is a sin. But if somebody was driving, normal driving, or biking, then he died. He's a shaheed, inshallah, if he's a, if he's a, a believer. If uh, somebody put himself in harm's way, and he caused himself to die, then he's responsible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُمْ رَحِيمًا Don't you kill yourselves. Whether by committing suicide or by doing anything which eventually would lead to killing yourself, harming yourself, because Allah is most merciful with us. Barakallah feek, Brother Ahmed from Qatar. Let's take a short break. And inshallah, we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Please stay tuned. <laughs> mentioned in the Quran in Surah Hijr, Surah number 15, Ayat number 86. Al-Khalaq is the superlative of Khalaq. He is the master creator. Don't you see how we have created the camels? Allah used specially the camel. Why? Because there are so many scientific facts. This animal is unique. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inviting us Al Khalaq is the one who created the camel. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah has 99 names, 100 minus 1. Whoever comprehends them will have Jannah. The supreme name of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is Allah. Allah is the greatest name of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. We talked about Al Ahad, its meaning and its implication upon us. We talked about Al-A'la, Al-Akram, Al-Awwal, Al-Akhir, Al-Zahir, Al-Batir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided everything on the face of the earth for us to do good. In order to do good, we need to first recognize the one who is the source of all goodness and that is Al-Bar. In a game of golf, both the caddy and the golfer have the same goal, to get the ball into the hole. Interest-free banking is similar. With a clear view of the fairway, a predefined agreement without shifting targets, things should end up where you want them. Your deposits are safe and your funds are ethically managed with a transparent and equitable approach to sharing risk and reward. No interest burden means more time to relax without the worry of nasty surprises. Rest assured, our interest is mutual. Jazz Bank, Nigeria's first full-fledged non-interest bank. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Uh, Brother Muhammad from Nigeria before the break inquired about making dua after the fard prayer. A dua is the greatest mean of worship and you can make dua whenever at any say time including after the prayer. But the problem is when some people specify after the father prayer to make congregational dua because this is something that is not prescribed nor was it uh, practiced by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but if somebody is making dua after the fard or after the sunnah prayer for instance occasionally no problem you can always make dua whenever you want to as a matter of fact if you're inquiring about the best times to make dua the ahadith indicated that أقرب ما يكون العبد من ربه وهو ساجد in sujood while prostrating yourself in the prayer and that does not include making an independent sujood as many people after the father prayer when they finish the adhkar of the prayer they fall in prostration to make dua that is invalid 
And instead of making dua and an act of worship, that becomes an innovation and it would be rejected. The other position where the Prophet Sallallahu used to make dua in every father prayer is after reciting at tashahud and before making taslim. And al masur that the Prophet Sallallahu would not finish the prayer before seeking refuge with Allah against four calamities. فتنة المحيا والممات فتنة المسيخ الدجال من عذاب النار ومن عذاب القبر The trial of the false messiah The trial of life and death The trial of the grave The torment of the grave And from the torment of the fire of hell It has been also reported in some ahadith That the Prophet وسلم, used to seek forgiveness from Allah After the tashahud and before making taslim uh, uh, asking Allah, Allahumma gfir li ma qaddamtu wa ma akhartu wa ma asratu wa ma a'lantu wa ma anta a'lamu bihi minni anta al-muqaddim wa anta al-muakhir and so on. So I like to focus on the times where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam focused on in making dua. Al-ibadah, brothers and sisters, most of our questions can be answered simply by saying, tell me, how did the Prophet ﷺ used to do this? Instead of saying, okay, somebody told me we have to do this or somebody is doing that. اتبعوا ولا تبتدعوا Follow and do not innovate. In the case of the prayer, the Prophet ﷺ said, صلوا كما رأيتموني أصلي Pray as you have seen me praying. In case of Hajj, خذوا عني مناسككم Copy me. Pertaining to the manasik, the rituals and the rites of Hajj and Umrah. That makes it a lot easier instead of making up new acts of worship or how to perform an act of worship different than the Prophet ﷺ would jeopardize your ibadah eventually. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Aisha from the case says, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu How are you, sir? I'm fine, alhamdulillah, barakallahu fiki. Uh, I have uh, three questions no. uh, regarding, yeah, regarding my friend. Uh, uh, she called me and she asked me uh, uh, to ask you that uh, actually her husband uh, is not so much religious. And, um, and she is more religious and she wants to brought her children in a religious manner. But uh, her husband doesn't want uh, in that manner. So in this regard, what she should do and... Uh, Regarding her children, they watch cartoons in, with music. So mm -hmm. in this matter, what she should do. And, and she always tells her husband uh, regarding uh, for praying Fajr, uh, uh, Fajr's prayer, but he doesn't listen. And uh, she, uh, she's a very educated lady. She wants to teach uh, uh, her neighbors Quran, but uh, her husband does not allow her. And, uh, and and he does not allow to uh, do uh, hijab with the brother-in-law. And so, in this regard, what uh, in this matter, what she should do? And um, you want and my advice? Also... You want my advice? This yes, whole yes. case should be presented before an arbitrator in the presence of both parties, because Allah knows best who is more religious than the other. You started yeah. with one thing and you ended up with ten things that she is superior to him in this and this and that. He doesn't pray Fajr in Jama'ah. He, uh, he wants the kids to listen to music. So we have to verify all of that. And then in this case, we establish the hujjah, the proof, that, uh, bro, this is what you need to do. You need to attend the prayer in Jama'ah. And uh, your wife must put the hijab on before the brother-in-law because he is a stranger like everybody else. Okay? In this case, let's see what he says. Maybe he doesn't know. Maybe he doesn't like the way that his wife uh, instructs him as what to do or imposes on him like she's commanding him what to do and what not to do. I'm talking about, and of course, from an experience, this is what happens. In many cases, the person will say, well, I didn't know simply, or I don't mind, but I just wanted to learn how to do it, what is the proper way to do it. So in your locality, if there is a local sheikh or a family member who can arbitrate and sit and listen to both parties and sort this out, that would be fine. Otherwise, if both of them are happy with uh, calling me, uh, being on the same time on the line, they can collect my number. I would be more than happy to do that to them. Barakallahu feek. 
Brother Islam from Canada. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Sheikh, how are you? I'm fine. Alhamdulillah. Barakallahu feek. Uh, my question is, uh, in, uh, uh, in Canada, I live in the uh, north part, okay? And here, um, Isha's prayer uh, starts uh, quite late at this moment, something around quarter to 11. Mm. But I heard from somebody that uh, he was telling the Isha prayer starts uh, approximately after an hour or 45 minutes from the Maghrib prayer. Mm. Okay, so is there any authenticity of this? Uh, can I follow that? Well, don't you give me the name of the state and I would like to verify that. And uh, um, I'm living in uh, Saskatchewan. Okay. And I follow the Islamic finder. Islamic finder, great. Um, for, for the Azan because in this locality only I and my wife is the Muslim, okay? Mm. So we need to follow only the online Azan. Mm. So. Y you know the Islamic finder is actually affiliated with Huda TV and it is owned by the same people. Alhamdulillah, shukla, they have done this for the sake of Allah and it is benefiting uh, hundreds of millions of Muslims. Everywhere I travel, whenever I wanted to know the Qibla or the prayer time, simply I go to our website, Islamic Finder. So inshallah, Azajal, I will investigate, but of course that will be answered hopefully in the next episode. Barakallah feek, brother Islam. Jazakallah khaira. Okay. Uh, brother Muhammad from Oman, I bet you didn't understand his question, but I kind of figured out what he meant because he's calling from this part of the world where there are a lot of people who pray only three times a day because they combine the prayer. You know, many of the Shia people believe that they always combine the prayer even whenever it's not necessary. Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah pray each prayer on its fixed time unless if they are Musafirin traveling at the travel distance and during the travel time or due to a necessity such as uh, rain, heavy rain, or, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, things which prevent them from attending the prayer in, in the masjid. But not on a regular basis, they just combine the prayers. So now we sorted this whole thing out from the beginning. It is not permissible to combine the prayer without a legitimate reason. Okay? And on a regular basis, only whenever there is a need, especially like somebody is in an operation or somebody is sick and it burdens him to uh, pray on time. These are temporary excuses and the person is given the concession in this case to combine the prayer. But these guys always pray it this way. And the masjid is closed during the rest of the prayer time. So we've seen this in some parts of the world. Uh, for us, uh, we offer the prayer in the masjid and congregation as much as possible as long as the masjid is in your reach you can walk or you can drive to the masjid so as far as answering that they pray after word right away behind somebody who's praying so now it doesn't concern us uh, anymore and that's why I'm not going to answer this question the proper way for Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is to pray on time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ كَانَتْ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ كِتَابًا مَوْقُوتًا Another question, which is, what if somebody entered the masjid and he missed the Quran prayer and he found somebody who's praying the sunnah? Can a person enter in the jama'ah with him and he's praying his fard while the imam would be praying his sunnah? Yes, that is valid. And it was practiced during the life of the Prophet وسلم, and it was the Prophet who encouraged one of his companions to get up to give sadaqah to somebody who came late من يتصدق على أخيكم a sadaqah in this case is to pray the nafli prayer the voluntary prayer when Mu'ad ibn Jabal may Allah be pleased with him used to pray with the Prophet وسلم, al -isha, in his masjid in jama'ah then his people in his neighborhood would be waiting for him. After he returns home, he would lead the Isha prayer again. Obviously, there are not two fard for Isha. It's only one Isha prayer. Similarly, every prayer. So, which one was his fard and which one is his nafl? 
whatever you offer first is the fard. And if you pray Isha again, that is nafl. So he was praying the fard with the Prophet وسلم, and he would go home and lead the Isha prayer. And the hadith is Sahih al Imam al Bukhari. Okay? I know that I was taught in the Hanafi madhab a person who's praying Sunnah cannot lead the prayer with a person who's praying fard. But due to the sound references, that it is definitely permissible to have two different intentions between the Imam and the Ma'moom, whether the Fard and the Sunnah or two different Fards. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Martha from South Africa. Martha. Assalamu alaikum. Try again, Martha, please. Now. Brother Muhammad from Oman also, he touched my heart as well as the hearts of all the audience. The oppressed Muslims in Burma, in Sri Lanka, and everywhere. May Allah give them victory. May Allah give them victory. May Allah give them victory. Uh, it is sad to see that those whom Allah blessed with wealth are supporting the enemies of Islam and those who oppress Muslims. You know, many countries, their economy prosper due to tourism. And we know that these rich guys go and spend millions of dollars there. The least, the least help and support is to boycott the oppressors and not to support them. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Unsur akhaka zaliman aw mazluma. Support your brother, whether he is an oppressed or oppressing. They said, Ya Rasulullah, how can we support him if he's an oppressor? He said, by stopping his oppression, by preventing his zulm. But we see all our brothers are being oppressed all over the world. The least is not to support their enemies by the ni'mah and the blessings of wealth which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon you. Wallahi, it breaks one's heart. But what can we say? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. May Allah guide us what's best. And may Allah give victory to our brothers and sisters in Burma, in Sri Lanka, in Syria, and everywhere. Allahumma ameen. Sister uh, Maria from Mauritius. Number one, yeah, she had two questions. Uh, dyeing one's hair with black. Dye with any color you desire, but not the black. Because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَجَنِّبُوهُ السَّوَادِ It was Abu Bakr's father, Abu Quhafa, who had gray hair. His hair was all gray. So the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, غَيْرُ هَذَا الشَّيْبِ Change this gray hair by any color and avoid the black. Because it is deceiving. And the greatest is henna because henna is a natural herb and it doesn't have any side effects. As a matter of fact, it is nutritive to the scalp, uh, strengthen the hair follicle. I mean, it has many advantages. I'm not uh, uh, doing commercial for any company because henna is available everywhere. Okay? So it is a sunnah to dye with henna, but avoid the black. Uh, when I said any color, any color, but not a color that is uh, like imitating an actress, or imitating somebody whom you know that these new fashions. We see some weird things happening in today's world. Subhanallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Umar from Tanzania. Yes. Ya yeah, Umar. Assalamu alaikum wa sheikh Muhammad. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Umar. Barakallahu fiqhu wa ta'ala umrak, inshallah. Ameen wa fiqhu. May Allah bless you and your family. I've got only one question. Go ahead. Regarding the dressing code of a Muslim woman. Naam. I just want to know the hijab, the abaya, the one they are addressing. Please try again, Brother Omar. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much. No problem. Sister Maria's second question is uh, the interest money which we collect on depositing our money in a conventional bank. We mentioned repeatedly that it is not permissible to use it or benefit out of it by any mean because this is filth, this is haram. And we must look for a lawful place to 
invest or deposit or save our money in. But if there is no alternative, such as if you're living in a non-Muslim society, then in this case, do not leave the interest. Rather collect it and get rid of it. Give it in a charity to an orphanage or, or, or. So she says, can we give it to the construction guys who are working for us? No, you can't. Because now you are a beneficiary. But if you know that somebody who is poor and is in need for this money, you may give him this money. And while I prefer that this money should be invested in non-profit organizations such as in hospitals and in orphanages and things of this nature. You can, for instance, uh, pay it for the landscape of the center or the masjid or the hospital or paving the roads and avoid utilizing this money for food or nutrition. This is a filthy earning. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Omar from Tanzania is back on the line. Yes, Muhammad. Go ahead, Yaqi. I was just finishing my question. It was about the dressing code of a Muslim woman, hijab. Mm. The one they're wearing with the black stones and the colorful stones. Is it allowed? Uh, and the uh, hijab, the one which gives the shape of the body, like tight hijab. That's not like hijab, that. Omar. Just something the proper dress of the That is not hijab. hijab. You know the ayah uh, in which, if in, in Surah An-Nur, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَا يُبِدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ If we just take this segment and dissect it, they're not, women are not allowed to show their zina. What is a zina? Zina is adornment. Zina is beauty. And the beauty is not only in the perfume and it's not only in, um, uh, in the makeup. The beauty is also in the outfit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The woman may be wearing from cover from head to toe. Today is Abaz, which you see even while going for Hajj and Umrah, a woman may be covered from head to toe. But the Aba is very revealing. Is this hijab? Of course it's not hijab. In fact, there is no difference between a woman who's wearing this tight Aba or shiny Aba and a woman who's wearing jeans because both are revealing their aura. Okay? The meaning of yudanina alayhinna min jalabi bihinna thalika adana an yu'rafna fala yu'zayin. To lower their garment from top to bottom in order to be recognized as she is a chaste woman. She's a woman who is obedient to Allah and in compliance with the sharia pertaining to hijab. A woman must cover her body parts Yes, there is a khilaf between the scholars pertaining to the face and the hands of a woman. But the rest of the body part, I believe a woman who's showing her face because she has taken the opinion of such scholars or views which says that the face is not aura, but she's wearing loose abaa and a proper khimar is much better than a woman who's wearing niqab, but she's wearing the eyelashes and the mascara and all of that and the makeup and wearing perfume and tight abaa al hijab is to cover not to reveal may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to what's best we just ran out of time and we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us our sins and to forgive our shortcomings and to support our oppressed brothers and sisters everywhere and give us victory aqul qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. We have the answers to these questions are uploaded on a regular basis. Alhamdulillah to that web page. Uh, we have a couple of pending questions from yesterday, from Sunday's episode. Uh, the first question was pertaining Salat al Tasabih, the very common question, and whether it is a Sunnah. Or not. Salat al Tasabih narrated in one hadith, only one single hadith, narrated by Al Abbas, the Prophet's uncle, may Allah be pleased with him, in which he said that the Prophet وسلم, said to him, Ya Abbas, Ya Ammi, Allah Ahbuka, Allah Utiyaka, Allah Utiyaka, and he counted ten verses 
the Prophet said to him, O oh my uncle Al-Abbas, shall I not give you, shall I not grant you, shall I not give you a gift? And he counted ten virtues. And he said to do the following. To offer four rak'ahs. In the first rak'ah, you recite Al-Fatiha. Then a surah, then afterward you say this dua or dhikr 15 times. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. You say this whole set 15 times. Then you make ruku' and you say it 15 times a ruku'. And you rise up from ruku' and you say it 10 times. Then you make sujood, you recite it 10 times in sujood. Huda, a light in every home. Allah is my heart's speech. Your mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen allow me to advance. Help me in my quest, permit me to pass the ultimate test. Help me in my quest, permit me to pass the ultimate test. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa al-aqibatu lil-muttaqeen. ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأولين والآخرين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Dear brothers and sisters everywhere السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome back to another live edition of Ask Oda Our phone numbers beginning with the area code 0020238552482 or 249 and the email address is ask at huda.tv and the Facebook page is www.facebook.com forward slash msalah official. We've been answering, mashallah, many questions that we received on the Facebook page and uh, the answer or the episodes which you set up from sujood 10 times you recite it. You go to sujood again. So the total number of saying the dhikr is 75 times in each rak'ah of the four rak'ahs. Uh, in this hadith, he said that the Prophet ﷺ said, if you can do it once every day, do it. If you can do it uh, once a week, do it. Or once a month or at least once in your lifetime. Uh, because he said, if you do so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive all your sins. And he counted many verses. Uh, this hadith is disputed between the scholars of hadith and sunnah as far as its authenticity. Some say it is weak, some say it's fair, some say it is sound. So those who consider the hadith weak and they do not rely on the weak hadith in establishing an act of worship, particularly prayer or fasting or whatever, they say no, it is not uh, recommended to do such ibadah because we cannot confirm the authenticity of the hadith and it's only narrated by one single person and uh, I deliberately mentioned the setup of the prayer because it's not like any regular prayer so this is something that's very unique and at least you should have had a few companions who are aware of that not only one person because it's the uniqueness of the setup of the prayer so that's why they said, no, don't pray it. And many scholars of the past, based on the fact that whether the hadith is sound or even the hadith is weak, but they rely on the weak hadith in establishing virtuous acts, even including the ibadah, they said, it is recommended to do it even once per lifetime. So there is a dispute between the scholars pertaining to offering salat at tasabih. That dispute and conflict should not reflect on our relation to each other or our relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why am I saying that? This is a bad new comment I'm making here. Because some people become judgmental of others. When one asks another, what do you think of Salat al tasabih He says, it's not the sunnah. Then right away he puts an X on him. Oh, this guy is such and such. He categorizes him. And another person, he says that, I'm going to pray Salat al tasabih like in Hajj for innocence. Some people get up to pray Salat al tasabih so others would label them as such and such group or party. It shouldn't be this way. There is a room whether to pray it or not to pray it. Okay? The least it is permissible. But no one should be judgmental of another based on this 
hadith or this ibadah or similar ibadat even relying on weak hadith. What do I do personally is, well, I have many alternatives. Yes, I may have done that in the past as I was young, but now I have uh, the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa min al-layli fatahajjada bihi nafilatan laka asa an yabaathaka rabbuka maqaman mahmooda the night prayer tatajafa junubuhum anil madaji'i yad'oona rabbahum khawfan wa tam'a surat istajda and many other ayat pertaining the virtues of the night prayer or at tahajjud resort to that uh, hadith uh, Umm Salama and others pertaining to the nawafil the twelve rak'ahs which if you observe on a regular basis, Allah will build a house for you in paradise, the emphatic sunan before and after. Do that. The verses of praying duha, the forenoon prayer, praying which. So I try to exert the effort in fulfilling the ibadat, which are 100% confirmed that they're virtuous and there is a great deal of reward in doing so. If somebody else does this ibadah based on the fact that he is following an imam or an opinion because many of the scholars of the very righteous scholars uh, relied on this hadith and they considered salatul tasabih is very vicious okay fine do it there is no problem barakallah fikum assalamu alaykum